Hello, everybody, and good morning. Um, we have, well, if you've been following the news, you know that there is a, a dire situation going on in Ukraine with respect to Russia right now. And of course, we have been following the news very closely uh, and almost to the point of distraction. And it occurred to me the other day, I don't really know anything about Ukraine. Like I'm following all this stuff, but Ukraine is just a country that it has never occurred to me to visit. It's never occurred to me to know anything about because it's sort of like a blind spot. I know it's Europe, but it's not really Europe in the traditional sense that we think about it. So I was speaking to Andrew the other day and I realized he does know something about Ukraine because he has visited there. So I thought it would be very interesting for all of us today to just learn a little bit about Ukraine from the point of view of a travel journalist who's been there and has seen it as a destination more than just speaking about it as a war zone. So good morning, or should I say good evening, Andrew, or is it Dobra Don? How do you say it? Well, now it's, it, it, you could say Dober Dawn. Yeah. That's a good day. But yeah, we're, we're all, we're, yeah, I'm like, yeah, it's dark outside. So what, would really look, but, <laughs> what would you say? What would you say then? Uh, Dober Vecher. Dober, Dober Vecher. 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 Yeah. Like okay. good, good evening. So just those of you who watch my, my broadcast, you already know Andrew, but you, pro I just want, as a little refresher, Andrew has spent most of his life um, traveling in Eastern Europe, especially uh, into the former Soviet republics. He has a huge interest in Georgia and Azerbaijan and Uzbekistan, and he's also married to a Russian. So um, your love affair with Russia started many years ago. The first time I met you, actually, you were about to go on a big voyage to Russia to ride the Trans-Siberian Railroad, right? Yeah, that was actually my first time like away from North America, so... <laughs> It's like, really? hey, where are you going? Did I think you I'm going to... where you went to Europe. Well, yeah, that's how I got to Europe because I took the Trans Siberian from east Vladivostok all the way to Moscow. So, uh, yeah, because wow. my dad, my dad was a huge train enthusiast, and he said, "Well, if you ever go to Russia, I want to do the Trans Siberian." And original, my original plan was like, "Well, I'll be in Europe, and then I'll go to Russia. Then we'll, you'll meet me there." And he's like, "Yeah, but you'll be in Russia in January." He's like, "Was like, I'm not going to Russia in January." I was like, "Okay, yeah, let's just start in Russia." And go the other way. How long <laughs> did that start. take you from Vladivostok? Uh, it's it's seven it's it's seven days. It's uh seven. It's a week. It's a week long. But uh, we broke it up. So, but anyway, yeah. If you're into trains, yes. If you want some peace and quiet, yes. Uh, it's not it's not super it's not super exciting. Um, uh, but it, it was interesting. And just a real brief, and then let's move over to Ukraine. Is we did that in 99. So that was like eight years after the Soviet Union broke up. And obviously, I had never been there before. My dad never been there before. And it, well, we both had the same thought, just looking through the towns and cities, the train passed through, which is, you know, whatever, 10,000 kilometers worth of places is. I don't know if America won the Cold War, but it was obvious that the Soviet Union lost the Cold War. Just going through these just decrepit, rusting, crumbling towns or whatever. That was kind of our thing because we didn't really think about it. What We didn't like go there because we were like, let's do all the Cold War stuff. It was just kind of our observation of like, oh, my God, there's a lot of places that look like, you know, they're not doing very well. Of course, That's I mean, funny you say that because that that was my same impression of um, the first time I went to um, Eastern Europe after the wall fell. I went to Hungary and Czech Republic uh, in '94, I guess it was. So that was not so long after the Berlin Wall fell. Yeah. And, and it was like you really felt like you were going into like a gulag or something. I remember pulling into Budapest and seeing all the communist bloc things that you saw in movies, but you didn't really think that oh, that's not really how they live. And then, oh yeah, it was, <laughs> it very much was. Yeah, it was, uh, as, as a child who grew up during the, the Cold War, visiting uh, Eastern Europe in the early nineties just confirmed everything that we saw in movies, you know? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and nowadays, if you go to like Prague and Budapest, you'd be like, really, this was like, you know, it, it's, but of course that's 25 something years ago, yeah. but yeah, it is, it's, it's, it's totally different now, but I think you can still go, plenty of places more further east and still be like, Ooh, looks like, looks like exactly how we thought it would look during the cold war. Yeah. Well, it's always been very interesting to talk to Natasha, your wife, because she has such a completely different point of view on life. And just the way she grew up was almost, it's, it's not exactly that she's from a different country, but she's from a different time, you know, cause I think that yes, a lot I, of <laughs> I, would, I would agree. Yes. It's like different country and different time and different, you know, whatever. 
teenage years or whatever, pick any point in your life in the US and then, you know, pick that person's same time period in the Soviet Union. I mean, yeah, I mean, I would think like your friends in Italy, they would have some things in common, their teenage years and your teenage years. Yeah. And it's totally different, I think, with behind the Iron Curtain. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just the, especially because she's not from Moscow or something. She's from a yeah. country town. I've always had the sense that she's she's from a different century. Like, you know, it's it's not even comparable. So it's it's interesting in these days when we talk about all of this stuff, uh, when we're watching this this coverage on the news and they talk about Russians, because obviously we've had, as travel professionals, a, a friendly relationship with the, the concept of traveling in Russia and all of that, and the Russian people, since they're our friends. Um, but it's, they very much have, you can't, you can't look at, at Russians as thinking the same way that we do, at least people of our generation. I would say people in the younger generations, maybe yes, but of our generation, not so much. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Just with like the expats that are expat Russians that are in Slovenia, the younger people, I think would be more, whatever, similar to, to us or to younger Americans. Yeah. Uh, but then I think any, anyone who was, there was a cutoff point like in that when everything fell, I think if you were probably over 30 and not yet like a kind of pensioner retired person, you're just screwed because it was too late to whatever, readjust everything. Yeah. And it wasn't like, well, I'll just go retire and, you know, live in the dacha and collect, you know, my pension. So those people like that would be some would be my age or a little older would be it'd be really difficult. I, I always thought it would be like, that would be tough. Cause you're just like, this whole world's different and not, not just like it's capitalism. It's like, everything's changed. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the stuff I feel like that we're getting from the leadership of Russia, what it says to me based on my knowledge of, you know, just from my travels and meeting people is that this is almost a generational thing. It's like people from a different time, <laughs> like, you know, the way they see the world is something from a different time. It's not, current you know no but then i mean you know what and i don't want to spend too much time talking about putin a man we shall not name but it's like then he's just on his whole old level of other just like whatever bad shit crazy but smart and all these other things i mean look i think it's obvious when if if all you needed to know about someone if they said oh the worst thing that happened the worst tragedy of the 20th century was the collapse of the soviet union be like, wouldn't that be like actually one of the better things that happened at least near the end of the 20th century? So I think when someone thinks of it like that, you know, you can, how can you, how could anyone relate to somebody like that? Yeah. Except for uh, probably all these people that were like, you know, the lost generation or two of like, what do we do now that our empire is gone and our systems change and everything else? Maybe the easiest thing to do is like, well, let's try to, you know, get it back together again. Yeah. Well, um, so what we thought we would do today is just to kind of um, talk a little bit about what is Ukraine like. Um, it's such an interesting place in the sense that it's it's almost hidden to us. I mean, I I consider myself to be a pretty well versed traveler when it comes to Europe, but the closest I've ever been to Ukraine was in northern Romania when we were on the, the border, and I looked at my phone and I was on a Ukrainian cell phone signal. <laughs> So that's the closest yeah. I've been to Ukraine is my cell phone has been in Ukraine before. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think I'm guessing people who have traveled a bit in Central and Eastern Europe probably have been closer than they than they think. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so I so I the first time I went there was 2008. And it was like, one, I was just interested because it was some, it was a former Soviet Republic. And two, they had just dropped that year, I think, the visa requir requirements for Americans. Uh, and I thought, and I had like, I don't know, eight days or nine days in between tours. And I was like, screw it, I'm going. And I had heard this, this city called Lviv, which is in the Western part of Ukraine. So actually someplace right now that does not have fighting going on, thank God, uh, was, was an amazing place. And so I was like, great, I'll just go there. So I spent a week just in one city seeing things and I left the, it left a, I mean, I had a, I had a great time. Um, and then I go, I went back a few more times. I even brought a few guests there. And then over the years, it's like one of those things where it's like, cause okay. Yeah. If you're flying, Kiev's not very far away, but if you're, you know, kind of in the neighborhood, Poland or Hungary or Romania, then Lviv is, is closer. And there's a few other places, which I'll show when I get to the photos that are, that are closer by. So I would kind of go back to those places because they were, you know, 
let's say not so far away. If you're in Krakow and Poland, you know, not, not that Ukraine's a day trip, but it's something you can go to really easily. And like you said, like in Romania, it's the same thing. In Budapest, you can take a train and you, you'll arrive in, in Lviv in time for dinner. So the other places, because Ukraine is huge. I mean, it's, I think it's the second largest uh, country other than Russia that's in Europe. Um, uh, and so like when people, when, when the last seven years, when there's all this fighting or the rebels were doing this, or obviously where the, where the KLM airliner was shot down by Putin's cronies, um, that was like so far away. It was like, well, God, like, like the Western part of Ukraine to that part of Ukraine is like, is like Western Ukraine to Portugal or something like that, you know? So in your mind, you're thinking, well, whatever's happening in the very far East is a long ways away because it's a it's a big country. Yeah, so that's that's a number one thing to to know is it's really far from France or Italy or what have you. But you know, of course, you're being European. Things are kind of all all tied together a little bit. Um, I see you're wearing your Romanian shirt, which <laughs> is interesting because when I've seen a lot of the pictures coming out of Ukraine, um, you see people wearing the Romanian style embroidered shirts, like the one that I have. Uh, with all the embroidery with roses and things. So Western Ukraine and Romania share a lot culturally, don't they? Yeah, I mean, so like the, that, the Northern part of Romania, the very kind of North part of Hungary and Slovakia, all that, like that, that's all borders Ukraine and all that area is got a lot more, let's say com commonalities and even the borders had shifted so, parts of what was Czechoslovakia is now part of Ukraine or some maybe part of Ukraine is now part of Romania, things like that. But yeah, I mean, you've got some like little ethnic minorities that are similar and you've got certain cultures and certain dress and things like that. Where you and I went to the uh, painted monasteries, that's this Bukovina region, but that's like just Southern Bukovina, Northern Bukovina is all in Ukraine. So at one point when the Austrians, the Habsburg empire had it all, it was just like, hey, you know, like, over here they speak Romanian and over here you know they speak Ukrainian and now it's in two different countries so yeah I would I would not be surprised to be in like the Carpathian part of Ukraine which is kind of this west southwest part and you would see something similar to this yeah so that, I, that's interesting I didn't realize that the Bukovina region of Romania was a larger region that does stretch into Ukraine but that makes sense because I remember yes. like seeing the mountains and Alexandria saying, oh yeah, those mountains there, that's Ukraine. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, when, we were, when I was there uh, in September, we did a, um, uh, yeah, when, when we go over the pass from Marmorsh to Bukovina, it's kind of like all these mountains when you're, when you're, you look a certain directions, like that's just the, the natural, the natural border there. Yeah. So, and then it was all part of this Habsburg empire. So like, like the reason <laughs> they have actually all, all quite a bit more, let's say, railways and things like that than you might think of is because all that was, you know, like they they connected all that through Budapest and Vienna and stuff like that. So there is kind of also just like, and I'll show in the photos, some kind of shared culture where people will say, oh, this doesn't look like Ukraine as much as I think, because it looks more like Budapest or Vienna or Prague, because, you know, they had this kind of connection with those other places. Well, and that's a little bit of what I'm what I want to get at today with what the pictures you show us is that I think that we are so conditioned, especially those of us my age or older who are, grew up in the Cold War, that anything that was ex-Soviet is very foreign. And that's something, you know, that has a negative connotation almost for those of us that grew up thinking we were going to be nuked all the time. Whereas, you know, they share so much with more central European cultures, you know, there's, there's, and there's so much beauty. I mean, the, the architecture, the Art Nouveau style architecture, the, a lot of the same stuff you see in Romania, you see there. So that's just sort of the, what I want to get at here is that you know, you, you have a sympathy for Ukraine more than you know, in the sense that if you're a person who loves Europe, you're a person who loves architecture and art. This is a country full of that. So let's have a look, Andrew. Go ahead and show us your, some of your shots. Okay. Okay. All righty here. So, um, oh, geez, you sure that's not Romania? <laughs> <laughs> okay, is the is this fine? Is this full screen or not full screen? Uh, it's uh, yeah, and um, it's let me see. I'm checking the live stream. Oh. Yeah, I think it, yeah, it's full screen. You're good. Okay, all right, all right. This okay. So, um, sorry. This is a, this was 
put together, not exactly in the most logical order. So I might be kind of zigzagging all around, but I'll mention. So um, uh, you, this is, um, this is uh, when we're talking about the Bukovina region, this would be kind of this northern Bukovina region in, in, in Ukraine where, you know, um, so about less than an hour and a half or so from the Rom Romanian border. This is an old fortress. There's, there's a lot of fortresses, lots of castles, things like that. And a lot of them are on rivers because Ukraine's got a lot of rivers going through. In fact, you know, like I think a lot of people see Ukraine and Russia on these river cruises. That always seemed to be like when people went to Ukraine, they were like, oh, I took a river cruise. Um, so this is the Dniester River, I believe. And this is this old fortress castle called Hotin, which is right on the right along the, the river there. Um, <clears throat> and that was I was visiting that between two different two different cities. Um, and the one thing, this is good and bad, but like places like Ukraine, when you have these castles, there's like, there's no rules. So this isn't like, oh, don't touch here. Don't walk here. There's no metal railings. It's kind of like, if you want to lean over and see how far down it goes to the river, like you can, and you could do whatever pictures you want. But you know, like if you fall off, like that's your problem. So it is really like, don't, if you come here with little kids, you know, like there's not the safety stuff installed like that we think of, you know, in, in our, in kind of normal uh, uh, places in, in, in Western Europe. Um, so this is a, this is a, um, this is a town called Kamionets Poldilski, and I'll show you this massive fortress in, in, a, in a second, but this is something that's, you know, like this kind of church, it's, it, it's got kind of the onion domes, but it's not like the classic onion domes that I think a lot of people think of when they think of Russia per se. Um, and in just to mention in Ukraine, you have, you have, you have Orthodox, you have a lot of Orthodox, probably the most, most of the, the people are Orthodox, but you also have Catholic. And then you have what you, what we had, what we found in Romania, which they were called like Greco Catholic people. They're like Orthodox people, but then they became under the Pope. So they had, they were kind of like this quasi somewhere between Catholic and Orthodox. Um, and then you have other even smaller ethnic minorities that have their own churches that, you know, are kind of neither in, in any category. Um, so this is this massive fortress, um, this, this town called Communist, Com, Communets, which means rock, Podilski, which I'm not sure what Podilski means. Um, but um, it, the, the, whole, the whole town is like kind of encircled by a river. There's a river around it and there's like three bridges running into it. And then you've got this fortress there. And this is like one of those places that like, it's one of the most impressive fortresses I've seen. And you can just kind of kind of crawl all, all over it. It's fantastic. Um, this is a this is a, a Catholic church that was converted to a mosque at one point uh, because the Ottoman Turks got this far this far north into Ukraine. And then when they were pushed out, they they turned this the minaret back into, you know, they left the minaret there, but they kind of turned it into like, you know, a place to put their statue. So I think there's some of those in other countries. I think Hungary has some church that was like church, then mosque, then back to church again. Um, but this is a little bit kind of wider shot of this uh, massive fortress you go to. So um, these were taken about 10, 11 years ago when I was there. Um, and there was some tourists, but I mean, you know, I met two Americans there and they, <laughs> they were in the US Army or something like that. And they were kind of just traveling around on their time off. Uh, so this is like one of those places because it's not Kiev, it's not like on the Black Sea, and it's not Lviv, which is much closer to all these kind of like Poland and things like that. So it's kind of in this quasi no man's land. So you have to like want to know about it and then kind of want to get there. Um, but you get the whole place to yourself. So, you know, I like that kind of stuff. Um, so what you were talking about, a really nice architecture in Lviv if people have been to Krakow or if they've been to Budapest, Vienna or Prague, Lviv is in that same kind of kind of classical Central Eastern European look with the architecture, except it's just, it's not as polished. Like it hasn't spent the last 30 years getting all the EU money and all the renovations and, and things like that. So you have a lot of beautiful details and things like that, but it's just not so, you know, polished up, which is, you know, which is actually kind of nice. It's, it's, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, and it's not over, it's not, it's just a, it's has tourists, but not touristy. 
Um, so I wanted to point out this, Sarah, because you and I talked about this earlier this week. So I have a friend, Elena. She's the young lady there uh, with a couple of my guests. She's a She's the first tour guide I ever had in Ukraine, and she lives in this communist Polsky place with the big fortress. Um, and uh, I, you know, just reached out to her and said, "Hey, if you need anything, if you need to get out of Ukraine, you know, you can come. You can come over here." She's got she's got like a three year old kid. Um, of course, her husband, as everyone knows, I think now like can't leave because they can get conscripted in the military. So yeah, like I know if I know some people like, I mean, I don't have like super close friends, but I have friends who are all working in tourism there in Kiev, Lviv and this place here, um, you know, and you know, I don't know what's, fortunately she hasn't reached out to me and said, hey, I need to evacuate, but you know. But you, you are ready to drive and go pick her up. So um, yeah, maybe. I'm ready for my crazy refugee road trip. Thing. Well, and we'll keep all of you guys posted if uh, um, if that does come to that, that she that this colleague of ours just needs to be evacuated. Andrew and I have talked about trying to sponsor her and helping her out. So we'll keep you guys posted about that. Yeah. And it was like when I met, what did I, she was probably like 20 when I met her and she worked at like a jewelry shop. So and but she was listed like whatever on the city tourism website as a guide. It's like, oh, I'll call her out, call her up. And obviously you can't really, you know, if you work in a place like this. Um, you know, you're probably not going to be guiding as a full time as a full time job. Um, but I just, you know, it's like, hey, this is great. I mean, you, you know, you, she was like kind of doing her thing and oh, sure, you got to get, to, you know, like, let's take a taxi to get to this, the fortress I showed you at the beginning along the rip on alongside the river. So I mean, people, you know, when you don't have a whole lot of tourism, and especially probably 12 years ago, when it was less than it was up until pre pandemic, you know, you, you really people really care, you know, really are into whatever their place or things because they're, they're excited that you come there, because they know it's not like typical for Americans, or Westerners or English native English speakers to go to these places unless it's maybe Kiev or something. Um, this is just this is a shot I believe from some it's from somewhere in Lviv so I wanted to I thought I, I didn't know if I had a classic shot with the Ukrainian flag I know everyone's got the Ukrainian flag colors going on on social media which is cool um, but this is just one of the one of the uh, shots from there and these are just more details from from the buildings you walk around Lviv and you can just kind of you can take a you know take a picture anywhere you got this is this main square which really really is very similar to what Krakow has um, you've got like a town hall in the middle with a kind of a tower which has all the views and it has all these kind of narrow buildings and each one's a different color and kind of a different style so I mean this does not look like what you grew up thinking the Soviet Union looked like I'm sure no, not at all, actually. Well, and not my experience of, of more Soviet, former Soviet places. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, to be honest, I don't think in my photos, like I have many photo, many pictures of those kind of concrete bunkers, which I mean, you know, those, you know, whatever, 20 story buildings that are just, you know, gray concrete slabs. Not that they don't exist, but they're not like everywhere. It's not like it's a spider web of those. Um, and uh, these are just some trams. One thing that I wish, and I didn't get, I didn't get to drop it in here, is the first time I went there, it was, I think the first day was a Saturday. And you know how it is in Europe, Saturday is wedding day. And I think like in Ukraine, I always think the more east you go, the, the bigger the wedding deal is. So you would just find these big wedding parties and fancy cars and people dressed to the nines and whatever. It was just like, it's a great thing to do. I think anywhere on a Saturday is people watch and see who's getting married. Um, uh, so anyway, I did, sorry, I can't, I don't have that picture there. This is just, here's some good, Ukraine is very good for, for comfort food. I mean, it's not so drastically different than what people would have in Poland, or if you've been to Russia, you've got a lot of soups. You've got borscht, but you've got like, let's say Ukrainian style borscht. You have some raviolis, but they're a little bit different than, uh, than um, uh, pierogies are. Um, and one thing that uh, like here, like in Lviv, the last time I was there was really interesting because they have all these little businesses that are all connected. Like you get a card, you actually have a card and it says, oh, actually I have it here. If you can, it's called, it's, it's just called, it's just Lvivit. And you get this card and, and there's like 
chocolate shops and there's bakeries and there's pubs and there's all these places that would not be out of place like let's say in Seattle. All kind of hipstery, all kind of really, you know, oh, very well designed, nice food. Of course, the prices are just incredibly low. And you get this card and you go around and whatever businesses you go to, you just use this card and collect points. And then you get, you know, credit or like, hey, here's a free box of chocolates or whatever it is. And, and I asked someone because I was thinking, well, there's not that many tourists here. And they said a lot of IT companies had moved to Lviv because, you know, there is you know, like a lot of places in former Soviet Union, you've got a lot of, you've got a lot of IT people and, and engineers and computer people and stuff like that. So it actually has a really cool kind of scene, the bar scene, pub scene, you know, eating out scene, more than you'd think, especially for a place that doesn't have tons of tourists. There's some chocolate shop coffee chocolate and coffee are big there they even have a festival that's like here's like a week of just a, usually in february so you're not freezing to death drink a lot of hot coffee and have and have uh, um the chocolates and there's lots of art like especially the viv there's always like murals to see and and like strange things that are painted and whatever it's very it's it's just kind of i don't know it, it very kind of creative um, the, this is just an outdoor museum. I think people maybe have seen something like this in, in other countries, especially maybe Poland or the Baltics, where you have, you have a lot of, you know, kind of people dressed up in old traditional clothes and you've got things made out of wood, all these churches from different places in Ukraine are all moved to like one area. So you can kind of see how these different, like I mentioned, there's a, quite a few different little kind of ethnic minorities that all have different churches or different building styles and stuff like that. So this is this is like almost like an outdoor park, maybe five kilometers outside of Lviv. So it's just a place you can you can you can walk to quite easily uh, there. So here's this is a this is an, a, another town that, that that the Habsburgs Empire built up and it's maybe one hour from the Romanian border. It's called Chernivtsi or Chernovsi. Um, everything in Ukraine kind of has two names. It's like there's the Ukrainian name, and then sometimes there's a Russian name, and then sometimes there's the other ethnicity. Like so, Romania has its name for Chernovsi, which I think is Chernovsi, and Ukraine's called Chernivtsi. Uh, so it's like if you Google anything, it's like got three different, two or three different spellings for it. Um, but there, it just really feels kind of like Vienna style. You've got beautiful coffee houses. You've got a lot of Art Nouveau. Um, there's a there's just a monument to uh, um, Franz uh, Liszt, this uh, Hungarian composer. I just love this little statue they have in their little piano uh, statue there. Um, this is uh, one of the universities that's in the uh, that's in this town here with this really just kind of crazy ass bizarre like brick um, style. Um, and then you'll always see lots of lions. By the way, Lviv means lion. So Liev is lion. So you've got Lviv is like the city of lions. So whatever language, like the Germans or the Poles, whatever they call Lviv, because they were all there, Austrians, they all have it. It's just the name for, for German for them. Yeah, here's this, like, this is a bank. This is a bank in this town called Chernovsi with this beautiful, you know, uh, mural there on the outside. So once again, not probably what you'd expect to see if you come to former Soviet Union country. Um, and this is just, there's a, yeah, this is another place in Lviv that I think this place had all these liqueurs. Um, and, and this is like kind of like some pub kind of drink place, just that, a coffee house, um, coffee roasting place. Uh, it was one of those things because like that's like I always notice why I'm in Budapest or Vienna like it's it's more like Seattle where there's lots of coffee roasters and stuff like that and they definitely have that kind of cafe culture roasting culture um, this is the one of the uh, brew pubs uh, actually the biggest brew pub in Lviv um, and on their social media the last week they have um, they have this post saying like like hey if you're if you're working you know whatever kind of you know, protection or, or, or military or anything like that, you're doing any service for the, the country, come in here, get a free drink, not alcohol, because they don't want those guys uh, drinking. And they're like, just, just remember to leave your guns at the, at the front door. And if you're a Belarus or Russian citizen, you're not allowed. Um, 
Uh, and uh, this is also the place where they have they have all these, of course, crazy beers. And when I was there last time, the guy who was the brewmaster was from the Pacific Northwest, uh, American guy. Um, so they have a they have a Merkel beer, they have a Putin beer, they have a Trump beer, they have a Obama beer. Um, and now they have, and I don't have it in the slideshow, sorry, but um, they have the Putin uh, beer bottle, and then they've stuck the what would you call it? The napkin in there. So it looks like a Molotov cocktail. So it's like their version of a Molotov cocktail with, with Putin on front. So they just like have those like outside of their place now. So I don't know, very kind of like creative people. It always reminds me of a place where like if if most of those businesses were in Seattle, you would you would be like, oh yeah, this is like this is like some place you'd find in Ballard or something like that. <laughs> um, what one thing that uh, that that you always find when you go to when you go to a country like Ukraine that used to be part of the Soviet Union is they have food from other places that used to be part of the Soviet Union. So if you want Central Asian food or Georgian food, uh, when you go to a major city in Ukraine, you could always kind of find that stuff. This was a place that just I think it was called maybe Samarkand or something like that. It was like an Uzbeki place, and they were people from Uzbekistan that lived there, and they served up all these plov and noodles and all this kind of things that you can get from Central Asia. Um, because especially during the Soviet times, you know, the food, let's say, wasn't so amazing and really bland. So if you were like from Uzbekistan or Georgia and you had something like interesting and spicy or things with herbs in it or things that weren't pickled, like most of the Northern foods were, it was like, yeah, this is great. So um, uh, it, even, even, let's say, before, everything's ha before everything happened, people in Poland, people in the Baltic countries, they would always be, you know, kind of supporting their ex-Soviet neighbors, you know, whether importing wine or opening up these types of restaurants and things like that, because they all had the one commonality of not wanting to be under Russia again, so. Uh, this, so one, this is a, a coffee house that was run, that's run by Tatars. So this is an ethnic group that at the end of the Second War, they're from Central Asia. Um, at the end of the Second World War, Stalin said, you guys collaborated with the Nazis. So he moved all of them out of Ukraine, and most of them were in Crimea on the Black Sea, um, back to somewhere in Central Asia or Mongolia. And then when Ukraine became independent, they moved back. So this, so you'll find them as a, as a minority you used to find them a lot in Crimea, and I'm sure now that Crimea is part of Russia, which was annexed like eight years ago, they probably moved more west. So they do like the coffee, they do this, you know, kind of like Turkish coffee style, like on the hot sand uh, and other things there. It's just a just a great place. And that's that's probably like the biggest like m m minority in, in Ukraine. When I was in Crimea ages and ages ago, like half the places I went to, people were or ethnic Tatars, so um, very kind of different because it brings this kind of Eastern influence into Ukraine, which you don't really necessarily think of. Um, and to be honest, I have no idea what happened to most of those people who lived in Crimea because for sure they didn't vote to get reunified with Russia. So I'm not sure where exactly they're at. These are just actually just some, some murals and some painted cars. Like people will like have a van or something of like, you know, advertising their place or just like, hey, here's this crazy coffee shop thing and we're gonna just like paint everything around it. Yeah, this is the, this is like this coffee van that was like advertising a cafe, uh, cafe so. And so most of the photos I have are from, are from Lviv. This is, these were just, you don't need to figure out the translation. You can see what they're going for, but they have all these crazy little signs like, you know, don't be stupid and get electrocuted or, you know, don't smoke here because, you know, you're going to die, things like that. <laughs> or I like this one, the lion kind of knocking over the tourist, taking the camera. So I do, I do kind of like the, the sense of humor there. Um, but, um, and then um, one of the other things too, because there's like Ukraine, like a lot of these places in ex Soviet Union, there's people from all these other old republics. So of course you had Armenians there. So this is an Armenian cathedral. Uh, that's in Ukraine. That's the stained glass at the top. And there's still like an Armenian population there, not very big. But um, once again, like their church is not Orthodox. It's, 
it's it's its own branch. It was actually like first Christianized nation in the world back in I think 300 or 400 AD. So um, you can find things like that because there there's a mishmash. I mean, if a hundred years ago you'd probably find Greeks and Jews and other things like that in some of these town in some of these cities because they were all just kind of part of this let's say even before the Soviet Union, part of the Tsarist Russian Empire. And they just, everyone kind of interacted and, and moved there or went there to go trade and work and stuff like that. So um, that's the Opera Hall in, in Lviv. Uh, I'm guessing, you know, all the, you know, what's nice is like everything I've shown, like none of this, you know, knock on wood, none of this is like under attack yet. And I don't really know exactly what's going to happen, obviously, but um, all this part of Ukraine is, is, is kind of getting bypassed by the Russian forces. Uh, and then I just have a few more photos in, in outside of Lviv, there's this beautiful, I think, like people know me, would travel with me. I like, I like cemeteries, not like Gothic stuff, but you know, like the Mara Moorish cemetery that's got all the creative, funny stuff. This is a really beautiful cemetery. I mean, it's like a beautiful park with, with all these sculptures. So this is a place you take a tram to and you get just wander through and admire just the, just all the, the, um, the just the kind of the, the beauty of it. Um, and it's not like some kind of, let's say depressing place. Um, and there's always a, quite a few of the lions because anywhere you go in Lviv is because it is city of lions. Like everything has some kind of lion statue, lion, lion sculpture. And then last thing here is just this is just a shot panorama. This is this little hill that overlooks everything in Lviv. So, you know, some people would jog up this. If you're a tourist, you probably just go and you spend 30, 40 minutes from the city center and walk up here uh, into the uh, into into the into the kind of panoramic shot there. So, wow, really kind of heartbreaking. I mean, Lviv. I'm sure most of you have been following this, but Lviv so far hasn't been touched because it's in the far west of Ukraine. So this is really close to the Romanian border. Um, so, as you said, Ukraine is a huge country. So the Russian forces haven't made it that far yet, uh, and we'll have to see. So you have a ton of pictures of Kiev as well, right? I, 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 I don't have, I mean, I do, I mean, that would, that, I, I would, I would love to do a Kiev and Crimea thing. Um, unfortunately, regardless of, of what happens, like, uh, I don't think anyone's ever going back to Crimea. Um, that was, like but my question is, do you, you do have yes. pictures of Kiev, right? Yes. Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't we make a, um, like uh, you find those and you let me know yes. when you find them and let's do a Kiev okay. slideshow for people. What, what okay. Do you think? Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, uh, yeah. So just when, when I, when I was, when I was moving to Slovenia in 2014, I was like, oh, in the summer, my first summer there, I'm going to go back to Crimea. Uh, it's a beautiful spot and it's got, it's got like all these microclimates. It can grow anything. It's got this, it's got all sorts of stuff in it. And it's not huge, but it's almost, it's almost like a little island, but it's like connected by a land bridge. And I think like about a month before I moved to Slovenia, right after the Winter Olympics in Sochi, uh, they had their little fake um, vote and it went back to, it went back to Russia. So um, like if, if you go to the Ukraine and you went to Crimea, let's say, you know, if there was no war, like a month ago, you, you can't go to Crimea and then go into Ukraine. So like Ukrainians won't allow you to go into that their X part of their country and then come into their other country. Yeah, um, I had heard that. Like you have to go the other way. Like you have to start in Crimea. You yeah, start if, you in went to, if you went to Ukraine, then you can go to Crimea. And then you have, of course, had to get a Russian visa because it's part of Russia now. And then you can go in there. And then from Crimea, you can, let's say, whatever, catch a flight to Moscow or wherever you wanted to go. Yeah. Um, but I never wanted to go back because I know, you know, like I, 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 I took a cooking class with the, with the woman who ran the guest house I stayed in. She was Tatar. There's no way she's there anymore. There's no way any of those kind of minorities are there anymore. So I'm like, you know, Hey, if it ever goes back to Ukraine, I'd go back. Uh, it's just unfortunate that, you know, I don't think it's ever going to change. Well, I was looking at some of the comments and it sounds like a lot of people, not a lot, but a few people were hoping to get to Russia or Ukraine. And those are things that are off the table for the foreseeable future. And I think at the end of the day, you do come around to the point of view that 
when should you go see the things you want to see? Go. If they're possible, go, you know, because you just never know when situations are, are going to change. So, um, yeah. So I would love it, Andrew, if you could maybe assemble another Ukraine yeah. slide. So, and, and I'm just saying this because I just told Andrew 10 minutes before we went on that I wanted to show you guys <laughs> slide. a slideshow. So, this was an incredibly impromptu <laughs> thing, um, but I just think it's really important to not to humanize the situation, but also to, I think it's really hard when we look on the news and we see people who are fleeing or we see bombs or we see apartment buildings, it's really hard to get a sense of, of what is that place for real. I mean, it's, it's really difficult, but when we look at, at somebody who knows it well, their travel photos, it does give us a more three-dimensional feel of what we're talking about when we talk about Ukraine. So um, go ahead and work on that, Andrew. Okay. Yeah, that's not a problem. <laughs> the one thing that I would, you know, the one thing that I would say that's not really more travel related, but related to the Soviet Union and related to exactly what's going on now is, so Sarah, I will put together my uh, Kiev photos. You need, wherever it is, I think it's on Netflix or whatever, you need to watch Chernobyl, not because not because of Chernobyl's just in Ukraine or whatever, but the whole point of Chernobyl is actually not about the accident, but the way the the the, the way the way they talk about the truth and lies and how everything worked in that old system then, which is far more you know, which is just as terrifying as all what almost happened, like with the ecological disaster. But I would say that for anyone, it's like if you want to get kind of a mindset, an idea of that mindset, you know, of like, hey, how can they still be spoon, spoon feeding, you know, the 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 news about their reality or whatever in Russia? It's like watch Chernobyl, and that will give you a lot of insight into like how those people thought and how they how some of them still think, because it's all about how you can distort. Distort, distort the truth. So that would be my recommendation. It, it is it is a fantastic thing, and it's not it's it's the it's so good that it's it can't be depressing, even though the subject matter is depressing. It's so well acted and so well written. So that I haven't be. seen that, but Nico has watched it twice all the way through. My fourteen yes. year old, yeah, because he yes. has a big interest in uh, becoming a nuclear engineer. So uh, <laughs> he watched it twice. Um, my suggestion, what? I was gonna say, just keep your hand off the AZ five button. You'll understand when you watch the uh, when, okay. you, when you watch the thing. But like, to be honest, like you know, because Natasha watched that. Other people I know who grew up in that watched it, uh, and the look of it, the look of it, the color scheme or lack thereof color scheme, and the grayness and all that is a lot of people say very spot on. So. Yeah. The one set suggestion I would have for all of you if you are looking to inform yourself more about the situation in Ukraine is actually a little more lighthearted. Uh, my children are always my my guides on all of these things. Uh, Nico, of course, can tell me everything about Chernobyl. Luca turned on YouTube the other day, Servant of the People, and I highly recommend everybody watch that. You can find it on YouTube. This is the comedy series that Vladimir Zelensky starred in before he became the president. And it's about a high school teacher basically kind of being almost tricked into becoming president because his students film him ranting about the political situation in, in uh, Ukraine and put it on YouTube. And it gets so many views that he ends up getting enough popular support to become president. It's a delightful show in this really dark time. It's so funny to watch. And at the end of that, I mean, we've watched, I think, three or four episodes. I seriously want to fly to Ukraine myself and wrap that man in bubble wrap and put a helmet on him. He is a national treasure. And so you can find it on YouTube. It's just called Servant of the People and it has English subtitles. So it's in uh, Ukrainian or I guess it would be, is it, it's Ukrainian. Ukrainian. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so I highly recommend it because he, then you watch him in these, these press conferences and you just can't believe how strange it is that life and art are mirrors sometimes. Yeah, it almost sounds kind of like what was the Jim Carrey movie, The Truman Show, or something like that? Like, yeah. I was like, like that's too crazy. Like that could never happen. Or could it? Yeah. So or, or absolutely it? watch that, Andrew. You should really watch it. It's, I mean, it's I'm a going... funny show. Actually, just the show itself. It's really entertaining yeah. and very funny and super well made. But the other thing I really loved about it is it really gave me a sense of what do normal people's lives look like in Ukraine? Because of course I'm thinking they all live in a gulag or something from my, you know, cold war, like 
you know, thoughts of, of my childhood, but no, like their kitchens and their houses look just like ours. You know, they, the Kiev looks like a really beautiful city. It's a great way to kind of wrap your mind around um, what's going on in the news. So, yeah. Okay, good. That's good. I'm, I'm going to check that out. Cause all I, right, so I mean, I, reverse I knew assignments. Okay. You watch all right. All right. Yes. Well, I'll watch Chernobyl and all of yes. you out there. I hope that this has been helpful to kind of help you understand a little bit more, at least visually what's going on uh, in the world today. Uh, if you are wondering just out of curiosity, what our plans are um, for tour season, we are running all tours as, as promised at this time, um, unless something really drastic happens, this is our position. We're going to keep, keep on keeping on right, Andrew. It, exactly. Yeah. Uh, we can't, I mean, we will deal with things when, well, I don't know, when, when we have to deal with them, but yeah, that's, there's nothing else we can do at this point. Yeah. So we're going to keep on keeping on. So uh, I'll let you know when Andrew puts together that slideshow on Kiev and we'll be back with you uh, chatting a little bit more about that. Uh, just an FYI, I am going to be hosting next week. Um, one of my guide collective uh, colleagues who is going to be speaking about Scotland next week. So we'll be talking a little about Scotland, but maybe before that we can drag Andrew back on to talk a little more about it. Yeah, I, I get, I'll have that in, in a couple of days. And then you and I can do like, like an old Siskel and Ebert. We'll be like, it's like, well, I don't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> what are you thinking, Sarah? Was this that funny? No, I'm joking. Critique right, each other so, in recommendations. Yeah, thumbs up, thumbs down, or I don't remember yeah. what did this when you ever do. I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, or yeah. one thumb up, one thumb down. I can't remember how they did yeah. it. Yeah, I, I, you get to be Ebert though. I get to be Cisco. Wait, no, okay, no, no, never right, mind. Then. Yeah, anyway. All right, you guys. So thanks for tuning in today. And um, just keep an eye on my Facebook page for um, when we'll come back and do a slideshow on Kiev. It should be in the next couple of days. So thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon. Ciao. Thanks, Andrew. Bye. Sure.